The Tidal Class. Almost all Tidal Class dragons live in the ocean, although some of them have amphibian-like biology allowing them to survive on land as well. Few of these dragons are able to create flames, but many can generate electricity. Dragons of this class, when trained, are exceedingly loyal. They are generally larger of those of other classes. Despite this, they are usually very peaceful ocean dwellers who prefer to be left alone. And today I'll be looking at why these specific sets of dragons are Tidal Class, and why some are not. If you're of legal drinking age, take a shot every time I say water, ocean, or any other synonyms of that nature. You'd be dead. The first category is the water boys. These are the most standard water dragons you would think of. There's nothing too special about them, they just fit into the title class almost to a T. For example, and the poster child of the title class, the Skuldron. Every time we see this dragon, it's in the water. Whether it's in a cove, the ocean, or water trough, its existence is based in H2O. So much so, when it's outside the water, in a matter of hours, it could dry out and die. It's adapted for life in the water, developing a tail fluke to propel itself, like dolphins and whales, tracking enemies using electroreception similar to that of sharks. This is something I would love to explain further in its own video, but that's then. And Skuldrons can stay under the water for long periods of time, going without oxygen similar to those of extinct marine reptiles. So there is a lot of similarities to marine life. They are exceptional swimmers, of course, keeping up with smaller, more manoeuvrable sea shoppers in a pursuit, and able to dive deep, ignoring the high pressures. Unlike a certain submarine, is that joke too old and distasteful? Yes. It's clear that this creature is very water-based, enough to justify its tidal classification, but it has more. The firepower is in a typical fireball or electricity, it spits out scalding water by sucking in the seawater and boiling it internally. It's just more advanced kettle. <laughs> in addition, they have venom. Yeah, it's just an extra thing that's not really indicative of a tidal class, but it's there, I, I, I guess. Oh, in Skull of Dragons, in the Dragon Tactics, there's a steam attack that you can poison the opponent, suggesting it can eject the venom into the boiling water, which I think is a really cool idea and amp the deadliness of this dragon. Rip Skull of Dragons. However, these are the most aggressive title class dragons, seeming to attack first and ask questions later. But I've said this before on this series and I'll repeat myself for this video, I believe not every dragon needs to fit into every single point in the category, just the majority of them. On a different side of very much the same coin is the Thunderdrum. This one fills all the asterisk definitions of the title class. Although yes, living in the water, Sometimes it spends its time outside of the ocean, so it has more amphibian-like adaptations. This is reflected in the biology of this creature. It has tiny arms, which is very emblematic of crocodiles, allowing them to go on land, but not really preferred. Although every time you see them, they seem to be chilling up there. Look, a little dude, a little guy. What are you doing there, little guy? Although they are very much adapted to aquatic life as well. Going a long time without needing to breathe air, diving deep, and using water to sneak up on victims. Despite not having fins or flippers, it uses its large wings to propel itself through the water. They use their gigantic mouths to attack or eat other animals, similar to large creatures like whales or whale sharks. <laughs> And very much like the basking shark. People say the UK has no interesting animals. It's the second largest fish in the world! Anyway, back on track. The firepower is very interesting as well. Having a sonic blast. Oh, sorry. SONIC BLAST! A strong concussive sound that can kill any human at close range. Sorry, I'll stop doing my still compression. <laughs> it's so powerful that it can be heard and felt miles away. It's also been stated to lower the air pressure in its way, making it feel cold and smelly. <laughs> the Thunder Drums have developed a system to offset sound blasts by regulating wave frequencies. A whole system just to prevent the shouting to hurt it. Although as a result, the Thunder Drums are partially deaf. <laughs> no worries though, they have great sense of smell to pick up the slack. These dragons are incredibly tough, with standing powerful smacks and dishing out powerful blows. Don't say it, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. Once trained, these dragons are loyal and very protective, especially over their young, more over their riders. Poor Stoic. Stoic got done dirty. <laughs> oh. Well, it's understandable. Look at the babies! Oh, look at the cute little babies! Next is the Sligrigrif- Sligrifer? Sligrifier? Sligrifer? How do you pronounce this? <laughs> These are rare dragons being nearly hunted to extinction by Skuldrum. Described as one of the fastest swimmers, it glides through the water at supersonic speeds hunting prey. This complements its firepower. The faster it goes, the more acid it can churn up and shoot. It's a slow shot, but powerful once it's built up in stream. It's a mixture of their mild, toxic saliva and seawater. Some possess darker colours to assist in the camouflage at night, 
abducting flukes and dorsal fins slash spies to help it in life in the water, and lastly the Soligrapha are shy creatures, but once tamed they are incredibly loyal, trustworthy, and protective of their riders. Last in this category is the Tide Glider. This graceful tidal class dragon doesn't simply swim through the water, it dances! They're extremely agile in the water and riding the wave. Judging by the way it moves, I can see the dragon gliding across the water's surface for hours after its namesake, so it's safe to assume it has impressive stamina. Being similar sizes to that of a Skaldron and Thunderdrum, their strength could be akin as well. Looking at the animal itself, it has adaptations suiting that of an aquatic lifestyle. Flippers, fluke, back spikes acting like dorsal fins allowing the creature to turn quickly. But getting more speculative, I'm interested in the structures on its head, the spines sticking out. It reminds me a lot of electric receptors, commonly found in aquatic predators for detecting prey, or even escaping. Their colours tend to be bluish, helping them to camouflage, which helps them when they are skittish in nature. But when observed at a distance, they are said to look calm, graceful and peaceful. So by their lifestyle and the way the animal looks is very much like those of the tidal class. But let's look at its firepower, as there are some similarities to some others, like the venom or the poison. Nobody is certain, but it could spray water or slash and acid. It looks like it could be a concoction of seawater and acid mixed together. Coupled with their venom makes it fairly deadly, kinda like the Skaldron, although we don't know what temperature it comes out as. It could be boiling hot, considering in the idle animations there is steam coming out of its mouth. Lastly, something that's indicative of the mystery class is that it has healing saliva. Yeah, this can be mixed with its firepower as well, so I'm curious if the animal could choose between the venom or the healing. Alternatively, it could heal the wound but get you infected with its venom and then probably die. The next category is the electric boy. Dragons, who much like the electric eel, contains electric potential energy in the body to use it defensively or offensively. Starting with the obvious dragon, the Sea Shocker. It gets its namesake via the ability to stun and generate electrical fields around itself effectively underwater. They admit electricity from the males that could be utilised in a bite or a short ranged attack. By joining their heads together it can create protective electrical fields similar to that of Skrills, and before anyone gets any ideas, no they are not related. This is most likely an example of convergent evolution. But the electric pulse can launch a human up to 60 feet, so there is some power behind that light show. So other than filling in a niche of a description of the tidal class dragons, what else does it have to support its placement? At this point, do I even need to say it? This animal is well adapted to life in the ocean, being one of the most speediest and most manoeuvrable out of all the ones in this class. To be fair, not the hardest achievement considering half of them are as large as the ocean itself. In support of their movement, they have echolocation, like dolphins, porpoises, and whales, to help navigate through the endless abyss. Oh yeah, content warning for anyone with thalassophobia, I guess it's a bit late now. <laughs> and their ability for bioluminescency is like real life examples. This could be used in multiple ways, to attract mates in the ocean depths, or prey as they think it's food. Even looking at their weaknesses, they are more more dependent on the sea compared to some others, like drying out on land, flightlessness, which is kind of dumb, and pod dependency, very indicative of creatures we've mentioned for like the hundredth time, despite them looking like a manta ray with two snake heads and a fluke sticking out a thin ass rat tail. But yeah, they tend to live in deep icy waters, with their spines on the back breaking through the ice. Sea shockers mainly seem friendly, they like working in teams coming from their pod dependency, by helping out and defending others. So yeah. Another fishy boy. Last up the electric boys, yes surprisingly there is only two despite the whole asterisk in the description, the shock jaw. This tidal class swimmer emits bioelectricity from a gentle jolt to a lethal bolt. The bolt emitted can be strong enough to take down an entire ship and its crew. So a very powerful electrical attack coming from their tendrils underneath their jaw. Interestingly, they also have bioluminescence supporting their aquatic adaptations in the depths of the water, and dorsal fins on its body to aid in the swimming and flying, in which they do well, as it's another one described as being one of the fastest. In terms of personality, they tend to keep to themselves, and won't attack unless threatened. So with abilities, adaptations, and the main habitat being suited for life in the ocean, it's clear that this dragon is definitely tidal class. This category coming up is the big boys. Look at the big boy. Not quite small or medium, but not quite huge alphas. These dragons are predicted to be as big or slightly bigger than whales, so definitely nothing to scoff at in terms of size. Like the Fathom Fin, only seen as a tease in the Serpent Air, but fleshed out more in the unreleased comic The Fire Tides. Luckily, Audrey interviewed Richard Hamilton, one of the authors of the comics, and gave us more details about the dragon. Just looking at where Hiccup first sees the dragon already confirms its class placement in the ocean. 
and, and being whale-like with the expandable gullet, becoming translucent, allowing anything inside to see their surroundings. I don't know what's more morbid, being eaten by a whale and consumed by darkness, or witnessing the last glimpse of freedom you once had. But based on the descriptive characteristics of this dragon and the small amount we have seen, there's a clear reference to aquatic life adaptation, and it being a rare deep sea dweller supports the classification. Although the one we see in the Serpent's Head is actually a Titan Wing. I know people are going to point this out in the comments, but on where this is now the canonical depiction of the dragon, in terms of direct canon behaviour, there's little to go on, but judging by it just chilling there, it seems peaceful. In the fire tides, however, it seems to be caring and intelligent, saving Hiccup and Toothless's life. The Fathom Fin returns to the sunken city, and we realise the reason that it has air is because the Fathom Fin keeps going up to the surface and getting a big mouthful of air and bringing it down and blowing it into the ruins to keep these guys alive. We then find out that there's another storm, and that is why um, the Fathom Finn deposited Hiccup and Toothless there rather than carrying them back to Burke or somewhere else. Like the Fathom Finn could tell that the storm was coming, it could feel it in the currents, and so there's sort of like a ticking clock and a reason why the Fathom, why she would keep supplying air to the ruins to keep them alive there until the storm finally passes. Also using its firepower to alert the Dragon Riders. It does this by spitting a flammable, soluble gel. By the sounds of it, it's kind of like monstrous nightmare gel, or perhaps an acid-like substance, similar to that of a couple of Tidal class dragons. Next is the Submar Ripper. Oh wait, no, it's the Rip Wrecker in the games, which is what I'll refer to them as due to the reveal of the true Submar Ripper in Race to the Edge. So, what is the Rip Wrecker? Well, it does have similarities to that of the Summer Ripper, like creating whirlpools sucking in Viking ships. They have an acid blast that can fire at opponents. Judging by the size of this creature, it could be quite a lot in one go. But the depiction in the comics shows this dragon literally ripping ships in half, using its own size and raw power, latching onto the ships using their tails. And lastly, it has a prehensile tail grabbing Vikings off a ship and drowning them. Upon further inspection, there isn't much in terms of unique features suiting a life in the ocean, other than perhaps a bigger build for more flubber, being mainly blue in colour for camouflage, and wings higher on the body to help it propel itself in water. Oh, and we do see them diving deep into the water. Even their behaviour deviates from the traditional tidal class, said to be very territorial and attack anything that disturbs them, or trespasses on their property. It's an old man. <laughs> Get out me swamp! But honestly, just living in the ocean, being very bloody tough with high endurance and strength, with the abilities to create whirlpools is enough to go into the tidal class. There isn't too much information on this variation due to it conflating with the other submariner from the TV show. It too can create whirlpools to suck viking ships, even powerful enough to drag down dragons from out of the sky, and then use the ammunition to fire back. In addition to this, they can create tidal waves by slamming their massive body against the water's surface, in order to drown its victims. To be fair, pretty much all large tidal class dragons could do this, but it shows their superior intellect compared to some others, sharing similarities of that of orcas using smart hunting strategies to overpower their prey, using their size as an advantage. We've seen this creature being chained under the water for days on end, so it wouldn't surprise me if they can hold their breath for long periods of time, or straight up have gills. They appear to be quite aggressive and attack anything that gets near it, but the example we saw most likely had a bad experience with humans, and was chained up, so I don't know if that characteristic really holds any water. Bit of tisk. Why am I like this? Although sinking innocent Viking ships while being in the depths could also be a sign of aggressive behaviour. Adding on to all this, they are great swimmers. I have no idea how, due to them having small wings with no flippers or fins, not even webbed feet. But they are smart enough to use the ocean to their advantage by sneaking up on the enemy shellfire to get the upper hand. So yeah, this dragon is very clearly tidal class. But this dragon is also labelled as a tracker class. To find out whether or not it suits that classification, go and watch the not tracker video. Oh yes. Speaking of the shellfire, this is another tidal class dragon that is ooge. The one we see in Race to the Edge is a titan wing and seen as a rival to the submarine. Despite being quite timid by nature, only surfacing rarely, although they are not afraid to protect their home, using their armour and protruding horns as defence or offence. This is giving me like armour fish vibes, like the Dunkleoskius. Dunkleoskius? I don't know if I said that right. What did they do to my boy? Due to this, they are incredibly durable, withstanding onslaughts of attacks, and carrying a dragon-proof metal submarine on its back with little to no hindrance. But they do struggle against smaller and more nimble creatures. We also see these are fast swimmers, able to dive deep in the water, in a matter of seconds, to be honest. Look at it go! And of course, they are capable of staying under the water for very long periods of time. Or they have gills as well. <laughs> there is a mention that when threatened, they can expel red algae from their gills that temporarily blinds and sickens their target. However, I have no idea where this is from. It may be from the Nine Realms. Um, I haven't seen that episode yet. So 
take that information with a pinch of salt. The last thing to mention is their amazing firepower. One that doesn't really suit the description, but is really cool, so who cares? <laughs> Although it's kind of electric based. Anyway, they can shoot large plasma charged boulders in a high trajectory ranged over a mile, being fired in rapid successions, enabling to destroy entire islands in minutes. This most likely works underwater for powerful attacks. Failing that, they could just ram the opponent. <laughs> but they are a formidable title class dragons that you wouldn't want to cross. He's challenging the Alpha to protect you. Yes, it's the Alphas. Not surprising, considering the ocean is the largest habitat on the planet and space to allow creatures to grow to such behemoth sizes. Oh, and they haven't really got gravity to worry about. Pfft, screw gravity! Qua, the very big boy, the Bewilder Beast, the absolute unit. However, they seem to be a protector of sorts of smaller dragons, providing food, protection and shelter to all those who follow it. Despite the authoritative figure, they are quite reclusive and non-aggressive in demeanour most of the time, because when it comes to protecting the territory, they are very formidable, using their massive tusk for great clashes, powerful ice breath attack, freezing anything in the way instantly, and mind manipulation to control others to do its bidding, as it's seen in many other alphas across many passes. According to Deeb Dubois, the mind control uses ultrasound which is only affected by dragons. So we've established that they are large, powerful, and alphas. How are they tidal? Well, considering they like chilling in water seems to fit the description. They have a few adaptations for life around the water. We've seen a bewilderbeast appear from the water with a great force and spend time underneath for very long periods, with wings and fins connected to the main body to assist in its swimming. I believe the spines along the body mostly help sense the vibrations in the water. Even their firepower is water-based. They suck the seawater and store it in the gullet in their necks. And when we release with their icy breath, most likely a chemical like liquid nitrogen or something, freezing the water on impacts. Further speculation is needed, a topic on an individual video on this dragon. So yeah, from all these features, it can only fit in one class, the Tidal. The other Alpha is an interesting creature, thought to be extinct and set to bring the end of the world, the Purple Death. Able to create massive sea quakes so big that the Vikings believed it brought Ragnarok, the end of the world event in Norse mythology where a lot of gods die, even Odin the Allfather. And I see why they think that, because on top of the quakes, by the sheer size of this thing, it can flatten islands. It's looking like Jormungadr, the world serpent, and coupled with an eruptive wave of fire exploding from their mouth, it can wipe out viking civilizations. So why is this thing a tidal class? Plumes of fire, earthquakes, that's boulder or stoker class, right? No, because this comes out of the depths. It attacks alvin ships, creating whirlpool because it's just so big. <laughs> and it resembles a few other dragons from the same class as well. We don't know much about this creature, but the only time we do see it, it utilizes the sea. We don't know if this thing could fly or even go on land, but this existential threat definitely comes from the seas and therefore a tidal class. Last of the alphas is the luminous crayfin. Yes, that little thing from School of Dragons. I actually changed the position of this dragon in the categories due to the information that was revealed to us before the School of Dragons got shot down. And that's that they can grow to be absolute behemoths, looking like a world turtle or the lion turtle from Avatar. This is a personal favorite concept of mine, hence why Deuteria is one of my favorite Pokemon. Um, so it's devastating we never actually got to see this in game. So why is this title? Well, it's a turtle with wings goofily strapped onto the sides to give it a resemblance of a dragon. Yes, this thing is still technically a dragon. <laughs> Being able to swing very well due to flippers and fins on the tail, in combination with lasting long periods under the water shows clear ocean adaptations in this animal. So much so it hinders it when it's on land. Due to these things, they're seen as fast swimmers and combined with jagged rocks on their back, it's said in Bork's papers that they can pierce through a viking ship, cutting it in half. So Lumi, why were you so useless? So what else do they have? Well, they can produce a low frequency sound, likely a communication method like whales, covering a vast distance due to sound travelling easier in water. In the same vein, the bioluminescence is thought to communicate with others in the deep sea, and allow the user to see. The luminous Craven gets his namesake from this ability. Lastly, they have a flashback. We see this ability used to temporarily blind their enemies. Note there isn't a firepower, which is interesting. 
It either has one but not seen, or just doesn't have it. Well hold your horses there, previous me. Yes, while editing the video, I've actually seen a firepower that it does have. Uh, an explosive ball. Kind of like Goku's spirit bomb. We see it as part of the drawings for the Leviathan concept. Although it looks like it's fire based, this dragon is still very much tidal. <laughs> First, in terms of behaviours, they are friendly, peaceful and intelligent. Making friends easily in social settings. It's unknown whether or not the adults are socially inclined or solitary. It's just like me for real. It's unknown whether or not this dragon contains any alpha quality but I put it here because of sort of more headcanon stuff. I feel like it would have. Judging by the size and how it kind of played in the role of the story, kind of looks like a wise old sage type thing. But if you disagree, you can lob it in back into the big boys. There's no real right or wrong answer with these categories. The last category is the not title class dragons. These dragons, I believe, shouldn't be in the title class, as they are far more similarities to that of others. For example, the Skywalker, sorry, the Windwalker. It's an odd dragon. It has some links to a title class dragons, with it being crocodile-like and a version of the firepower that are like others. But other than that, this is more of a sky dragon rather than an ocean one, with main depictions and descriptions of this animal in reference to the wind and storms, right to its name being Windwalker. Looking at the dragon, it doesn't really have any adaptations for living life in the ocean. Even their habitats are just random locales that's just not the ocean. The only thing I could find it linking to the title class is the abilities, and even then it's still very questionable. For instance, it has a water blast in School of Dragons. Great, a water ability, very title class. Yet in Rise of Burke, it has a fireball firepower. It even has a third firepower with electrokinesis, which I personally think it fits this dragon more and has more lore around it. So my personal headcanon is that it has that electric power. Let's look into it more. It can absorb lightning from the storm clouds to generate an electric field around its body, just like the Night Fury and the Skrill. The speed even rivals those of the strike class, a big contender for it to be in that classification, being described as like gale force winds. So uh, yeah, this dragon is definitely more strike class than anything else. Yes, the electric firepower is a descriptor of the title class, but how it interacts is like other strike class dragons. On top of that, with no references to water or ocean life or adaptations, it's safe to say this dragon should not be title class. But wait. There's more. Some individuals have phosphorescent wing patches. <laughs> Try and say that word. Some individuals have phosphorescent wing patches, which reflects the light from a starry night sky. They can even make shooting stars appear in the patches, with legends claiming that any wish on one of the shooting star reflections will come true. Aww. It's still not tidal. Oh, and the behavior and personality is that they are kind and gentle, yet brave and protective of their eggs. Which is like other tidal class, but at this point, who cares? Am I right, gamers? <laughs> any of these traits could be on any dragon. Hmm, the Sand Wraith, a weird title class dragon. I very nearly kept it in another category due to having some adaptations for an aquatic lifestyle. Larger lungs to hold its breath under the water for longer periods of time and burying itself in the seabed to ambush its prey. But the rest of the biography implies they spend more time on beaches. Sighting a Sand Wraith is no day at the beach. Hiccup was the first to catch sight of this title class titan when it was discovered resting on the coast of Impossible Island. My fellow School of Dragons administrators and I recently took a fishing trip to get some more food for our hungry dragons. We were all laughing and having a good time, until Bucket took one step and something moved below him. Come to know it was the infamous Sand Wraith. And in combination of it burying to avoid the sunlight, it reminds me way too much of another non-tidal class dragon. Now, hanging around beaches isn't necessarily not tidal. It's stronger than absolutely no references to near the sea at all. But this dragon has so many other similarities to other classes, as a result, I kinda need stronger reasons for it to remain as a tidal class dragon. Like, the mud rate curve exists. See the tracker class video for that. Ironically, both of the dragons I've mentioned in this bit, I've actually put in the Nox section in both of their videos, suggesting one of them could be Tidal and the other Boulder, which I kind of think this dragon should be as well. From the burying behavior to the firepower, which is spitting hardened balls of sand and fire, like ingesting rocks and launching it back out. But for me, what tips it over the edge is the known subspecies, the desert rape, who live in the sands of the desert with absolutely no dependency on the ocean, and the sweet rape, which honestly is identical to the others, it's just smaller, bright pink, and it's said in legend to let Vikings fall in love after an attack. But note, nothing to do with the oceans or aquaticness. Oh, and being a fury-like dragon doesn't help it as well. They are typically strike, and the sand wraith are described as smart, on par with the other furies, although I do personally prefer some of the other furies to be in multiple classes. But their temperament is interesting as well. 
been shown to be fierce rather than docile, although a couple of title class dragons I've mentioned before have had this attitude, but it doesn't match the description we're given. But that's okay, as I mentioned before, not every descriptor needs to fit in this category. Most of them, however, should, and I believe the Sam Wraith doesn't have that. Just having light adaptations to spend time in water, I don't think is quite strong enough to put it in this class, where it has a lot more stronger, bolder tendencies. Thus, this dragon is not title class. This is one of the most simplistic classes to write about, due to if the dragon lives in the ocean or not, is the justification whether or not it belongs in this class. But it's interesting to see the different inspirations of each one. I want to thank these amazing artists for amazing pieces of work in this video. This is so appreciated, thank you very much. Please support them if you can, thank you so much. Soon there will be a poll on the next not class video you'd like to see. And please consider supporting me on Patreon, it'll be a massive help. Thank you. TTFN? Ta-ta for now.